So I'll tell you about brief uh, personal background. Um, I've been engaged in uh, as an entrepreneur in the intersection of AI and the law for about 20 years and uh, advancing really the proposition that scientific methods can advance the functions of the law and the values that animate the law. And with that hat on, I've been one of the people who early on were proposing proponents of the adoption of AI and legal systems. Uh, I'm also a political scientist by training and a citizen, and I've been very concerned by uh, the proliferation in the wild of AI and the legal system. And so for the past decade, almost, I've been engaged in various endeavors of, that relate to the governance of AI and legal systems specifically. And <clears throat> I share in particular the, uh, the, the two initiatives that are focused on that, the Future Society and the IEEE. The IEEE, which will be part of the focus of the Commons today, is the world's uh, largest technical organization, association, about 400,000 members, and one of the world's largest standard-setting bodies. And we've been very engaged in uh, sort of advancing norms for AI ethics. If you think about <clears throat> governance, so my speech today is about what principles should govern the adoption of AI in the law, and how can one think of that in a practical way, right? That's what the speech is about, and to tell you what's happening internationally around that. So there have been a lot of endeavors generally about AI governance, right? Uh, and it's been with the European Union that just released its own principles a few months ago. It's been with the OECD that also released its principles for the adoption of AI in society, and that um, has been sort of endorsed by 50-odd countries. You have the ITU who's engaged in the use of AI for sustainable development goals, and a whole bunch of other international endeavors and even many companies and think tanks, et cetera, have advanced their uh, AI ethics guidelines, if you want, that they have. And all of this is very useful, very helpful, very valuable. Um, but what about Lady Justice? And <clears throat> interestingly, the, the, the rule of law, in a way, the justice system has been strangely absent from the global, global AI governance uh, conversation. Um, and it's quite an interesting thing to see. I, I've, if I had a penny for every time I went to a conference where I heard about you know, the legal liability consequences of autonomous vehicles, I'd be doing very well right now. Uh, and if I tried to, you know, to think of the same thing, how many times w did I go to a conference that really thought about the consequence on the legal system, on justice as a whole on AI, it's quite rare. So in general, it's not, and I say in general, I mean, there is great work being done there as well, but in general, it's been surprisingly absent as a unit of thought, the legal system itself. Two, when it is being discussed, interestingly, it's usually within the institution rather than as an institution. And that's a subtle but really important discussion. And I'll just give you an example of that. You know, when lawyers meet to talk about, uh, you know, AI and, and ethics, they really think about legal ethics, professional ethics. So it's a, it's, it's a component of the institution looking at its own responsibilities, but legal ethics is different from societal ethics. Same for judges who think about judicial ethics, but that's different from societal ethics. Same, same for companies like mine, when they think about AI and the law, we're, we're very worried about IP protection, but that conversation also leaves out legal ethics. And so a lot of the conversations happen within the institution, not thinking of the law as, as an institution. And that is, I think, has been a challenge. And also, generally, when there is a conversation about what should govern the adoption of AI in the law, we, uh, we, get, we think about uh, specific legal systems as opposed to across legal systems, right? So common law systems, or that system, or this culture, that culture. And so that creates great fragmentation in how we think about that. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the state of affairs as it has been. And it, it's a real challenge, right? I think we, we all believe that, we intuitively know that, you know, AI potentially offers the sort of the, the destantalizing vision of a more just society devoid of institutional biases, uh, dedicated to and really capable of affirming and advancing the equality of all human beings in front of the law and the equality of the, the, the well-being of all citizens in front of the, uh, in the eyes of the government. And of course, the inverse of that, the, the risk is that it might dehumanize the legal system entirely, sort of captured in this uh, crushing, I would call it efficiency trap, that uh, where instead of seeing we as citizens, uh, you know, legal technology empowering us, we're actually subjected to sort of these artificial caretakers, right? And all we have to, all, so what we're engaged in this sort of this risk management exercise between the benefits and the risks, and that's sort of a global challenge. 
I, I don't know how many of you are familiar at all with legal technology or the, how AI has appeared in the legal system. Anyone has had exposure to that? Uh, okay. Um, so I'll just leave that up there for anyone who wants a sort of a snapshot of generally the, you know, or a screenshot of generally the sort of applications that exist. I've highlighted two in blue that are important. Uh, one is risk assessment tools. Has anybody ever heard of Loomis, the Loomis case? So that's risk assessment in assessing whether a person might recidivate or not, and I think Sharad is going to speak about that later, so I'll, I'll set it aside. But that really has a direct implication on people's freedom, quite literally. And then what we call electronic discovery, which is, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, just a big search exercise. When you have big litigation, big investigations, you may have you know, 50 million documents or emails to look through to find the smoking guns, the key information. Uh, discovery has, uh, AI has been applied to discovery very substantially in the US for about 20 years, uh, more, more over the past five to 10 years. But, uh, and that's the domain in which I've worked, by the way. Uh, how do you summarize, at least in my view, the question we're facing in one question? I think that's, that's, that's the way I conceive of it, and the IEEE Law Committee specifically conceive of it, which is when it comes to legal systems, the practice of law and related compliance, meaning regulatory compliance, to what extent should we entrust intelligent machines, decisions that affect people? How do we make that decision, right? Um, and there are a few folks that tried to answer this question that really thought about the justice system as a whole, uh, and I want to give credit to the Future Society, again, I'm part of it, so, you know, uh, full disclosure here in my association, but as early as, you know, 2017, 16, I think we published a, certain, a set of principles, again, thinking of the institution as a whole. Uh, the, the Dubai Global Governance of AI Roundtable also was pioneering in having a law committee whose purpose was to not think of the legal consequences of this or that autonomous weapon or vehicle, which is also very, very important, but to truly ask the question of how do we think of AI and norms of the adoption of AI and legal systems as a whole. But the tool I'll discuss today uh, is the Council of Europe, because I think it's extremely important, its work, and it's going to be very consequential, and the IEEE. Uh, both of those um, have, uh, both of those published earlier this year, principles specifically for the trustworthy adoption of AI in legal systems. They are, in, to my knowledge, the first, the first two and only so far organizations that have done that, really thought of the legal system, the practice of law, and put forth specifically principles for the trustworthy adoption. So that's why I want to talk about this. Uh, and they were published near concurrently. Uh, so the Council of Europe, for those of you who might not know this, is different from the EU, right? It's, it's not the EU, it's also an international organization, and it's, it's in charge of the advancement of human rights, uh, the rule of law, democracy in Europe. Um, it's, it has within it uh, uh, an entity called the European Commission for the Efficiency of Justice, which is the one that promulgated these principles. And those principles exist in this ethical charter they have, uh, for the use of artificial intelligence in judicial systems, right? So they're saying, here is what we think. But I should mention, by the way, the European Court of Human Rights, some of you may know, is actually their instrument. So it's an incredibly important entity um, in that respect. Um, the, 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 their ethical charter was the first text of that nature adopted by an inter intergovernmental organization. By the way, I should mention, it's in the fine print at the beginning, I don't speak for the organizations I'm, I'm here to talk about. The comments are mine, but everything I say, obviously, I believe reflects what they would tell you as well, right? Um, two, they have a, a specific purpose to lead to certifications, right, which is something really important because certifications are sort of the currency of trust in society, um, and they're aimed at all stakeholders, uh, and the, obviously the purpose is the adoption of the trustworthy adoption of AI in the law. So what are those principles? I'll go a little bit quickly over this, but it's respect for fundamental rights, and that's as, as encoded, if you want, in the European Charter for Human Rights, uh, European Convention for Human Rights, um, non-discrimination, quality and security, transparency, impartiality, and fairness, and under user control, as they call it, meaning, you know, humans involved, right? So this is what they put out there, and what they're working on now is thinking about, okay, how do we take that and make sure that it can be implemented in practice in all of, the, of Europe's judicial systems, right? That's sort of the next chapter of their, of their mission. And they announced actually a specific program that would uh, lead to certifications, and they have just set up also an ad hoc committee on artificial intelligence called CAHAI. Uh, I'm not exactly sure the acronym, but anyway, it's the ad hoc committee on artificial intelligence, uh, whose purpose is to create a legal framework 
it's a multi-stakeholder endeavor to arrive at a legal framework for the adoption of AI um, in Europe uh, with, I think, an ambition to make it binding. But obviously, that's a political process that will follow on that. So, so that was published, I think, in January this year. So it's recent. Um, sorry, I mentioned that. Um, and so now let me move to the, to the IEEE, which is the other set. So again, I think of, of these endeavors, the Council of Europe is incredibly important and I think will be consequential internationally, uh, meaning beyond Europe. The IEEE itself, as I mentioned, is a global standard setting body and think tank. Um, and it has uh, instituted what we call the Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. We don't use AI as a term at the IEEE, we say autonomous intelligent systems. And its whole purpose was to promulgate certain principles for the adoption of AI. And within that, there was a law committee. So that's the committee I was part of. Um, and the way we thought of this challenge was to say that in order to, uh, to allow that risk management exercise between good and bad, if you want AI, innovation, adoption of AI, we needed to arrive at the definition of informed trust. What does it mean to really trust in an informed way a system? Um, and we thought, we had some design constraints around that. We said what, we, what we're trying to achieve, and I, and I just want to quickly touch on those, and I don't have a ton of time, but we wanted the principles we came up with to be uh, individually necessary and collectively sufficient, applicable to the totality of the legal system. That goes to the comment I made earlier, which is we don't want to look at in, in fragments. We want to have a unified framework, uh, globally applicable, but culturally flexible, right? So how do you promulgate things that can be useful? IEEE is a global institution, right? We have, we're everywhere that can be useful to every single country, recognizing there is great diversity of cultures, but effectively offer something that can be applicable in any legal system, irrespective of legal tradition or cultural tradition. Um, considering the legal system as an institution accountable to the citizen, again, that's really important. I highlight it here, because it goes to the point I made earlier. Very often, people discuss a legal system from within, lawyers about legal ethics, judges about judicial ethics. And it was really important for us to think of this success is tested in the eyes of the citizen, with the legal system in its totality, all of us as participants in it being accountable to the citizen. Uh, and finally, and also importantly, those principles had to be applic uh, applicable to future innovation, right? You don't want to be doing this every year. And also being capable of being operationalized. Very often aspirational principles are hard to think of in practice, right? So these were the sort of the design constraints. And what we're proposing, right, uh, is the following. We think that if these four conditions are met, if these four conditions are met, um, informed trust is established. Effectiveness, competence, accountability, and transparency. I'll talk to two, two of those quickly. Accountability, transparency are, um, I think, more discussed generally. <clears throat> and I believe the event especially will talk about transparency. But effectiveness and competence, it, in my view, surprisingly, have not been part of the global AI governance dialogue. You don't see that come up often. And it's very interesting. One would wonder why. But so let me, let me go to, the, to, to talk about these two. The principle of effectiveness is this, is to know, effectively it answers the question, does it work, right? Um, does it succeed at meeting its intended purpose? So for example, let me take an, a separate example, you know, cars are manufactured to uh, achieve a certain degree of car safety, right? Well, is, is the car manufacturing system effective at assuring car safety? We know because we crash a car, we do ca a crash tests, right? That's how we know whether or not the goal is met. Effectiveness is really important there. We have, you know, clinical trials for drugs and so on. For AI, somehow that concept doesn't quite exist. I want to show you quickly what the studies that were done for AI in discovery. These were done by NIST, which is a metronomical institution. So that's all they do is measure stuff, US NIST. Uh, and they conduct these studies. They're a little dated. They ended in 2011. But that was assessing how effective AI, mostly AI systems were at the task of discovery, which is a complex information retrieval task, right? So that's assessing a whole bunch of emails to try to find information that's important or relevant to something. I won't go into detail in this chart. All you need to know is success is on the upper right-hand corner, failure is on the lower, lower left corner, and here were the results of those studies. So it's all over the place. Some people did well up there on the upper right, a lot of people did not that well, and many did very poorly, right? And so the more you're close to here, the more what that means in practice is that the case is adjudicated without access to all the facts because it means that many, many facts, many emails that were relevant, much information that was relevant, was not identified as relevant by the systems used, right? And so what that tells you today is that, yeah, you, you can trust some systems, probably others you can't as much, so what evidence do you have on a day-to-day -day legal system as to whether or not, you know, 
you're up, up here or, or down there effectively. So, so at IEEE, we believe the proof of effectiveness, scientific evidence of effectiveness, the crash test of AI, if you want, the clinical trial is really important. Uh, and that, that tells you the extent to which you can trust the system. Um, I quickly want to talk about, I have five minutes, so I need, I need to rush. The, the second one is, so that you'll talk about risk assessment, I'll move from that. Competence, so that's the other one that I feel is really completely absent very often from the societal dialogue on governance of AI is uh, trusting that the person who is using the AI is actually competent to their job. And, you know, we have competency standards for lawyers, certainly, for doctors, for pilots, for cab drivers, and even for plumbers, right? You, you would not call a plumber to fix a leak unless they're qualified. For AI in the law, everyone has the competence to determine their own competence, right? And that's simply not tenable. Uh, when the people, the lives, the liberty, and the right opportunity of people are engaged, um, and so I, I'll move on from that slide, but th th there was an interesting thing from this study as well that, that showed that people were actually, participants in those studies were very bad at assessing how good they were themselves. Uh, and that chart illustrates that, but I, I need to, to move on, unfortunately, given the time we have. Um, accountability is much talked about, so, so I'll move on from that as well. But the accountability is important because if you can't hold people accountable, you don't have a disincentive to just being careless, right? And an interesting thing in the domain of algorithmic risk assessment that Sharad will speak more about is that today when somebody's risk is assessed by an algorithm, an algorithm and somehow the judge decides on a long sentence that is not fair, right, that shouldn't be that because the algorithm recommended that, nobody's held accountable. Not the judge, not the lawyers, not the manufacturer of the, of the technology, nobody. That is simply not sustainable. Imagine if a drug, for example, failed and we could not hold anybody accountable, right? Society can't live this way. And therefore, having accountability in place is also important. Um, I'll have to move on transparency. Um, I have, I'll, I'll end with just a couple of quick things. Th there is this interesting, there was this interesting case from the 1920s, I believe it was in the 1920s, called the T.J. Hooper case, where very quickly a couple of barges sunk uh, because they collided and the question was, you know, uh, why did they collide? One of them did not have a radio system or they didn't have radio systems on them. And the question was, well, was the owner liable because those barges were not equipped with, with radios? And as you see the relevance in a minute, the, the court, uh, Judge Learned Hand that you see here, who was an extraordinary judge by most accounts, effectively said that there are some precautions so imperative that even the universal disregard will not excuse their omission. So there is this interesting question for the future, which is if there are areas of the law where AI is actually demonstrably more effective and efficient than humans, whether it's as a lawyer, as a judge, you could imagine in the distant future, or in any other legal task, is there a point where lawyers, judges, courts would be actually uh, uh, negligent in not using AI, right? Would you be obligated to use AI because it's better than what, say, a human lawyer can do? And that's a really interesting question with all sorts of, of implications. Um, so the, the, the main point I try to convey today is that we, are, we have this complex risk management uh, task that we're engaged with, that there are two entities that really have focused on this question specifically for legal systems. It's the Council of Europe and the IEEE. Uh, they both developed a set of principles. The IEEE principles specifically are intended to define informed trust and we believe, and we put this proposition out to, to, to the world really, that if you can demonstrate effectiveness of AI, is it effective the task it's supposed to, to achieve, and you can measure that, and I'm not sure you always can, but if you can measure that, if the operator is competent, if you can hold people accountable, and if you have transparency, you can achieve the informed trust. That doesn't mean necessarily you have to deploy AI, but it means that you have the information you need to make decisions of the extent to which you can trust AI in your realm, whether you're a lawyer, a judge, or, um, or a regulator. The one thing I want to end up with, because I've been involved in these discussions for a long time, and I know I have just one minute, is that discussions, when you get into the, the guts of it, very often become very technical, very technocratic, and it's all about the capability and the efficiencies of AI and what you can achieve with it. And so the last insight I want to leave you with, maybe, is to say that when we are confronted with the notion that inevitably we will more and more automate our legal system, and entrust our lives, our liberty, uh, our fate to auto automated systems. It's, it's really important to remember not just what AI can do, what efficiency can contribute, but to really think about what AI is not. 
and to remember that um, AI can't, you know, bond with a spouse or a partner. It can't uh, mourn the loss of a parent. It can't nurse a sick child. It can't be uh, consumed uh, with anguish or remorse. Um, it can't experience any of the joys or pleasures of, or sorrows or suffering that we as humans can experience. Um, and that means that it is really incapable of empathy, uh, which is so important in the administration of justice. And so that as we contend with the changes that are in front of us, we should really keep in mind that irrespective of what AI is as a sort of a technological feat or as a, as a blank canvas on which so many of us project sort of futuristic fantasies, there is one thing it is not and that it will never be, and that is artificial humanity. Thank you very much. Thanks. Welcome. Um, so yeah, I want to dig into a little bit uh, uh, one concrete application domain, risk assessment tools that Nicholas mentioned. And so just so that we're all on the same page, I, I suspect many of us have, have heard about these risk assessment algorithms. So in the US, shortly after someone is arrested, a judge has to make this high stakes decision. And this is, I, mean, I think this goes to Nicholas's point about empathy, that there's this idea there that the judge is making these decisions based on experience, potentially based on empathy, looking at an individual and then deciding whether or not to release them uh, pending trial. And I think this works reasonably, I mean, it can work reasonably well. At the same time, there's worry that empathy doesn't actually apply uniformly to everybody. And so a judge might say, oh, this person looks you know, trustworthy, this person looks good, and so therefore I'm going to uh, treat them in, in some way that might be less harsh than somebody else. And I think this is exactly the, the, or one of the reasons where risk assessment tools are coming in to aid that human decision maker. And so not to uh, take on this, like, this human role necessarily entirely, but to, to, to be a tool to guide that decision. And so these tools work by estimating usually two different types of things. The first is an individual's risk of failing to appear at trial, and the second is their risk uh, to public safety of committing a new crime in the, usually in the next two years. And so these are usually called algorithms, but really they're just checklists. And so I want to demystify them for, uh, for a minute. And so this is a pretty popular um, quote unquote algorithm checklist that's, that's used across the country. It's called the public safety assessment. And it's a little bit hard to read here, but it's really just four questions. And you get points for each of these questions. So let me just give you a hypothetical defendant. So this is an individual with no pending charges aside from the one that they're arrested on, uh, no prior convictions, or two prior convictions, two prior failures to appear in the last two years, and then no prior uh, missed court dates before that. You just add up the, the points for each of these different factors, and in this case, you get a five out of seven, which is quote unquote high risk under this risk assessment tool. So they're very, very simple, and when you look at them, I mean, hopefully this, again, demystifies a little bit about what's going on, and that these are statistically derived usually, but they are really just structuring one's judgment and, and helping one, uh, force one to, to think in a particular way. So why, why are these used? And again, I hinted at this at the beginning. The, the, they're used in, in part because of this belief, or in large part because of this belief that they can help make better decisions. Now, this is incredibly difficult to really know rigorously whether or not they're making better decisions than humans. Um, we have kind of 40 to 60 years of judgment decision-making research that suggests that algorithms of this sort are better at estimating risk than humans. I mean, think about uh, weather prediction. And so if you're trying to you know, figure out, I guess Palo Alto is an easy place, but if you're somewhere else and you're trying to figure out what the weather is gonna be in the next few days, that's hard. You have some experience, you can do this, but it's an algorithm usually is gonna do um, much better. Uh, and so there's like strong intuition that these types of algorithms would be better than humans. At the same time, randomized control trials are hard to carry out in this setting. Um, if we look at observational data, then that's also difficult because we don't know what happens to individuals that a judge make a different decision for, so we don't know what that counterfactual is. And so we have to play some statistical games to, to try to figure this out. And so with those caveats on mind, I just want to briefly show you the results of one study that we carried out. So this was with observational data in a large jurisdiction in the US. And so in this particular jurisdiction, um, flight risk is the only thing by law that uh, that matters, that judges are supposed to, to consider. And in this jurisdiction, about 30%, about 30, a third of defendants are required to pay bail. The rest are released on their own recognizance. And overall, about 13% of individuals fail to appear at their trial. 
And so this is unaided with just you know, judicial discretion. So we tried to estimate what would happen if we were to switch to an algorithmic risk assessment. And in that case, we saw that we could go from 30% uh, 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 defendants um, uh, required to pay bail to a 20% of defendants required to pay bail. So 70% released on their own recognizance to 80% released on their own recognizance with no uh, change in the, in the proportion that would fail to appear in trial. So this is pretty significant. So this is uh, about a third reduction in that incarceration. Usually if you're required to pay bail, many of those people can't and so they're incarcerated. So this is a pretty dramatic decrease in incarceration with no accompanying increase in the proportion that, that failed to appear, which is by law what the jurisdiction cares about. And so this is the promise of risk assessment tools, that by, by having these statistically guided decisions, one can make both more equitable decisions and, and also reduce incarceration uh, without any increase in, in this uh, public concern for failure to appear, and similarly for public safety. Um, so that's the bright side. Now, the dark side is this worry about bias. And so here is one article that um, by ProPublica that I suspect, again, that many of you have seen a version of this. The, the title pretty much says it all, machine bias. Their software used across the country to predict future criminals and is biased against blacks. The software that they're talking about here is uh, a version, it is a risk assessment tool. It's called the Compass tool. It's very similar to that, that uh, PSA that I showed at the beginning. Um, but now, the, the rest of the time, I want to spend trying to dissect this claim. So what does it mean for an algorithm to be fair, and what exactly is the claim that they're making in this, uh, in this article? So there are a bunch of different claims in the article. The thing that really struck, uh, that stuck with, with a lot of people and, and raised this issue is this one simple fact. And so we, re we redid all their analysis, and so the facts are all right is the interpretation, which I, which I think um, uh, bears some more emphasis. So what are the facts? So the facts are that black defendants in the particular jurisdiction that they looked at, Broward County, um, Florida, black defendants were incorrectly rated as high risk by the algorithm than white defendants. So let me put some numbers on this, and this is, it gets just a little bit subtle, so I wanna make sure I, I say this correctly. Among black defendants who did not ultimately go on to reoffend, 31% were deemed high risk by the algorithm, among white defendants who did not go on to reoffend, 15% were deemed high risk by the algorithm. So this is what's called the false positive rate. So they were falsely flagged as positive. Positive here means that they would reoffend, and they were falsely flagged this way. And so this is about twice as high. So the false positive rate for black defendants was about twice as high as the false positive rate for white defendants. And remember, if you have a higher false positive rate or if you have this, if you have, if you're flagged as high risk, all sorts of bad things can happen. You're more likely to be detained. You might lose your job. You'll be separated from your family, um, incur uh, financial costs both to the state and to the individual. So lots of bad things are going to happen. And these things are happening uh, falsely at a higher rate for black defendants than white defendants. Let me just see, how many people feel that this is like terrible? Just like raise your hand. It feels like this is like something has gone like terribly wrong. Um, so I think that's the right reaction, and that was my initial reaction too. That the first time I saw this was like, oh, something is just going really wrong. They don't know what they're doing. Now we're just going to come in with our computer science and we're going to you know, make the world a better place. Uh, problem is that this is it's actually a much more subtle issue, that this doesn't mean what we might naively think it means, and so I want to try to explain what's, what's happening here. But it is, uh, it is a little bit subtle. So I'm going to do this in pictures. So here we have our two groups. We have our, our blue group and our orange group. And, and, and they're lined up according to their risk. And so on the left-hand side, we have the low-risk people. On the right-hand side, we have the high-risk people. And because they're two groups, they're going to have different risk profiles. Not anything because of the inherent riskiness of, of some like traits. So here we're thinking of race, for example, separating this. So we might have the, the top group might be white defendants, and the bottom group might be black defendants. And it's not because of their race that they have different risk profiles. It's just lots of things are associated with race, socioeconomics, all of these other things, and so they're just going to have different risk profiles. So this side of the room might have a different risk profile than this side of the room. That's what we would expect. And this dashed line is showing us where the algorithm might indicate is, is the threshold for high risk. So on the right-hand side, we might say everyone who has greater than a, uh, or at least a 50% chance of, of reoffending, we're going to deem high risk. And to the left-hand side, we're going to say anyone with less than a 50% chance of reoffending is low risk. 
Okay, everyone with me so far, and we're making this judgment. We have a risk score for everybody, and we're assuming these are correct, um, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but we have these correct risk scores for everybody. Some people are calling high risk, some people are calling low risk, independent of group membership. Okay, good. So now, let's compute false positive rate for our blue group. So what does this mean? So what is our definition of false positive rate? Among people who do not reoffend, what proportion are deemed high risk? That's our definition of false positive. Among people who do not reoffend, what proportion are deemed high risk? Well, here are a bunch of people. Now, some of them are going to reoffend. I just, you know, randomly, some of them are going to reoffend. The people who reoffend in, in red here are more likely to be skewed to the right than to the left. So, how many people in this picture do not reoffend? We just can count them up, and we get eight. And then, of those people, of those people who do not reoffend, how many are deemed high risk? This is the audience participation part. Uh, are, are not deemed high, or are of those people who do not reoffend. So the people who do not reoffend are in blue. The people who reoffend are in red. So among the people who do not reoffend, how many are deemed high risk? Two. And so we have two over eight. And so 25% false positive rate. Among people who do not reoffend, how many are deemed high risk? Good. Okay. Let's do the exact same thing for our orange group. Remember, the orange group is pushed to the right because they're a higher risk group. So coming back to our blue group, is it gonna have a, the bottom of the fraction is gonna be bigger or smaller in this case? So are, are more people gonna reoffend in the orange group or fewer people in the orange group if it's pushed to the right? In more people, it's a higher risk group. And so what is the bottom of this fraction gonna be? It's gonna be smaller because these are the people who do not reoffend. And now because there's so much mass to the right of that line, the top is also gonna be a little bit bigger. Okay, so now, again, I'm just kind of skipping through the details here, but our false positive rate it ends up being about 42% in this case. So here, just mechanically, we, if we have two different groups, and one group is just higher uh, base rate of recidivism than another group, so we have our orange group has a higher base rate of recidivism than our blue group, then if we draw a line somewhere, and say this group is high risk and this group is low risk, we're gonna have different false positive rates. And typically the group with the higher base rate will have the higher false positive rate. And so this is inevitable and it's not even really a product of algorithms. It's a product of making any kind of binary decision that if I'm going to base things on risk and draw a line, I'm gonna have different false positive rates. And so in a sense, I would say the fair decision, I mean, this is kind of a legally strong notion of, of fair, or what I think what most courts would, would call fair, is drawing a line and then making decisions regardless of group membership based on where you fall relative to that line. Um, that notion of fairness is incompatible with this error rate notion of fairness. Now, my position, and I just think this is controversial, is that this has been advertised as some kind of impossibility, that you can't have these two different types of fairness at the same time, which is certainly true, but my position is this is actually not a type of fairness that you would like, that it's, it's a misunderstanding of what fairness means, that false positive rates are not capturing something that is substantively important. And so let me, again, push on this, on, on the intuition that you might have a little bit here. So you might say, well, this is fine. You draw a line, and in some sense this might be fair, but the orange group feels like they're worse off. It feels like something has gone terribly wrong for that orange group, and we're unhappy about that. So let me push on that intuition. So what can we do to lower the false positive rate for the orange group? Well, we can go out and we can arrest a bunch of college protesters. So why are we gonna go out and, a bunch, and arrest a bunch of college protesters? Well, so first of all, if we do this, our algorithm is gonna know that they're all low risk. We're not gonna change anybody else's risk score. We're not gonna change the decisions for anyone else we made. We're just gonna go arrest a bunch of college protesters. Our algorithm is gonna tell them, tell us that they're low risk, and now we're going to immediately release them. Great, so the orange group is certainly worse off. I hope we all can agree that the, this orange group is certainly worse off. What's gonna to happen to my false positive rate? Any, any idea? So it's gonna go down, and why is it gonna go down? Because all of those people, or almost all of those people, are gonna go into the bottom of the fraction. Why is that? Because by changing my distribution of risky individuals, I've just, and, I, and I've, I, none of them are deemed high risk, and none of them go into the top, but I've increased the proportion, or increased the number of people that do not go on to reoffend. So I went from this, which feels like, oh, the orange group is really being hurt in some way, to this, where it feels like, oh, okay, error rates are the same, but almost 
certainly I would say all of us agree that the orange group is worse off. And so this is again showing us how these statistics can be misleading. The point again isn't that we think there's some incentive problem that if we were to say you gotta equalize false positive rates that officers are gonna go out and, and start arresting relatively low risk people. I'm, even I'm not quite that cynical. And so I don't think that's gonna happen. The point is that the, uh, that the statistics are about the distribution and our notions of fairness, our legal or common understandings of fairness about things that happen at the margin. And so if we don't understand that conflation, then we can end up with all sorts of bizarre results. So here we haven't changed the margin, but we've changed the distribution of risk. And so that ends up changing the interpretation of these statistics. So this is what uh, some economists call the problem of inframarginality, that these statistics depend on characteristics away from the margin, even though our notion of fairness um, is closely tied to what happens at the margin. Um, OK. so. Um, now there's this question that, that uh, so I, I did this under the assumption that everything was, that these risk scores were perfect. And so what does perfect mean? Conditional on everything we know about an individual, this is their empirical likelihood of recidivating. And I tried to set out a scenario that even in that perfect scenario, things break down with these conventional notions of fairness like error rates. Um, so now I want to come back to this question of what if the data are biased? And what does that even mean? I mean, this is a common phrase that, that we hear all, all the time. Um, but what, is it that, uh, what does it mean to say that the data are biased? So let me uh, jump outside the criminal justice context for a minute and go to school admissions. So St. George's Hospital in the UK, this is a real story. They developed an algorithm to sort medical school applicants. This is something that I can sympathize with. I read you know, hundreds of, of applications every year. And you would say, okay, this is, this is quite time consuming. Let's just develop an algorithm to do, take the exact role of that human and make these decisions much faster, much more efficiently. So they trained an algorithm to mimic past decisions made by humans. Everything was, was fast. Uh, this turned out to not be a great idea. Uh, uh, so what what happened here? Any any ideas? What's the problem? So so it's so in in a sense the algorithm worked too well. You, the humans told the algorithm do what I would have done. The problem is it did what they would have done, and past decisions were biased against women and minorities, and so the algorithm codified discrimination. Now, there's still this question of is it doing this, is it, is it, wor is it worse or better than the human decision maker? It's, we, I, we don't quite know. Um, but at the very least, it was, it was um, codifying some of that discrimination in that human decision maker. Uh, and so here, there is, is what we insist is called bias labels or measurement error, in that the thing that you're predicting is not the thing that you actually care about. So in school admissions, you care about identifying people who would be successful students at the institution. In reality, what they're doing is predicting people who would have been admitted in the past. In the criminal justice setting, we usually estimate the probability that someone is arrested or convicted for a future crime. In reality, what we care about is whether or not they commit that crime. And so this is particularly problematic for, for low-level offenses like uh, drug crimes. And so there, we know that drug use is relatively common uh, is, 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 uh, use is, is similar across race groups in the United States, but who's arrested for drug crimes? Typically black and Hispanic individuals, often because this is street crime and police are deployed in neighborhoods where, uh, uh, where they can see this crime and then there are all these downstream consequences. And so there's a mismatch between what we want to predict the crime itself to what we actually predict, which is arrest or conviction of that crime. And these things are not the exact same thing. So I think this is actually one of the biggest open problems in risk assessment algorithms of what is it that you're predicting uh, downstream. So I just want to um, uh, end on one more example that what factors are legitimate to use <coughs> in risk assessments. So this is another place where quote unquote bias can enter the, enter the decision making. So is it appropriate to base risk estimates on factors such as employment, housing status, age, and gender? What do you, what do you think? Are these legitimate things to base um, uh, uh, decisions on? Anyone, anyone want to defend any of these? So Susan wants to say something? <laughs> no, <laughs> they, they feel bad, they feel bad. They, 
you, but you may meet them. So they feel bad in some factors, like you know, they, they feel like they're proxies for race in socioeconomics. Gender is itself a protected trait, so it feels bad to make decisions based on this. But excluding these highly predictive factors like gender can create inequities. And this goes back to this, the Loomis case that Nicholas um, uh, was referencing. And so this is roughly what was, what was happening in that case. So in, in many jurisdictions across the United States, they're using a gender-blind risk tool but it meaning that gender does not come into play in, in these risk assessments. At the same time, we know that conditional on criminal history and age, which are the common factors in these tools, women tend to recidivate at lower rates than men. And so you have a plot that looks like this, where we have our risk on the horizontal axis and the recidivism rate on the vertical axis. And so for any given risk score, women tend to recidivate at lower rates than comparably rated men. So for example, women who have an eight, this is real data, not synthetic data. So women who are scored an eight have about the same risk as men who have a five and a half. And so if we use a gender blind tool, what's gonna happen, we can, we're effectively subjecting women to a harsher standard. Now, maybe we think this is okay, some jurisdictions think this is okay, that we would rather have a tool that does not depend on gender, and, and we're willing to sacrifice this potential, you know, we're willing to say that we are gonna treat women effectively harsher, or we might include gender in the risk assessment tool and, and use that same standard in terms of risk. So this is difficult, I don't know what the right answer is, but I think it's certainly something to be uh, aware of. So in the last couple seconds, I just wanna summarize by saying that there is no universal measure of fairness and I don't think it actually makes sense in algorithms, the same way we wouldn't go in and talk about a statute and say, is this statute fair or is it not fair? I don't think that is a question that makes sense. I think we have to accept risk assessment tools on their own terms, that they provide, they're designed to provide estimates of risk, and then our job is to, is to evaluate the equity of policies based on those estimates. And so, for example, an algorithm might say that someone is, is high risk of flight, one option is to detain them. Another option, which is what we're actually doing around the country now, is to send them a text reminder to say, hey, you have an upcoming court date, or for example, uh, arrange for door-to-door -door rideshare service. And say, this is a limited resource, we know that you have high risk of failing to appear at court, and so we're gonna give you supportive services to help get you there. And so we're lowering someone's risk. So we're using the algorithm to identify people who, who might need this type of assistance, and then we're doing what I think is more equitable at the end of the day. So I think this is the way that I like to think of, of these tools, rather than talking about the fairness of the algorithm, talk about the fairness of the policies. If you're interested in, in this type of work, check out what we're doing at the Stanford Computational Policy Lab, and if you wanna read some more about it, um, here are a couple papers that, that cover the material that I just discussed, thank you. Uh, so now for something a little different, uh, AI without statistics and without machine learning, yet relevant to uh, the legal system. So don't be surprised if you don't hear me talking about those same issues. Let's see. Okay, so you're in a state on a business trip, a new state on a business trip. Go to your hotel, you get up in the morning, make your way to the meeting, hop in the car, Gee, does, um, what's the speed limit on the street? You can't seem to find a sign. Can you make a right turn on a red or not? Can you use your cell phone while driving in this state? Can you make a U-turn on this street? Can you park here at this time of day? Hmm. You go home afterward, you got some chores you want to take care of. Can you ship that wine to your aunt in Virginia? Can you buy that drug from the pharmacy in Canada. What if you ship it to Canada? Working on your medical insurance payments, does your medical insurance cover in-home care for your sick mother or not? The law and contracts you've entered into have answers to all these questions, but they're not always available to you at the time you need to make decisions. And frequently they require services of experts, sometimes lawyers in order to make those decisions. So the fact is that we live in this highly complex regulatory environment where we have personal rules that we are abiding by, but also contracts we've formed, uh, rules of the organizations we're immersed in, and importantly, laws of our local, state, federal, 
international uh, governments. Um, the fact is that these laws are not always easy to comply with, or not even to be aware of, uh, because there's, a, first of all, a lot of them, and they're very big and growing all the time. The standards by which we abide are usually pretty small and well understood, so I'm just going to give you a few things here. It's the Lord's Prayer, 66 words. If you're religious, that's meaningful for you. Um, the Gettysburg Address was 286 words. The Declaration of Independence, 1,322 words. But if you're going to sell cabbages, you need to worry about 26,900 words because the rules have to be more detailed to deal with all the specifics of the sales of cabbages. So there's a lot of information you have to know if you're going to enter the cabbage sell selling business. Furthermore, some of those rules and regulations are not that easy to understand, and they're sometimes comp very complicated, even if you get them, get you have your hands on them. This is a little excerpt from my homeowner's insurance policy. When I <laughs> had some water damage, I was very happy to read page 32, which says that my water damage is covered until I was told on page 112 that the coverage on page 32 doesn't apply to water that came in from the outside. And it's more complicated still when you realize that sometimes there are gaps in the laws that we have that don't cover cases, or worse, overlapping and sometimes inconsistent laws, and we have to deal with those. The problem with this is that all this complexity, size, and sometimes inconsistencies leads to lack of compliance we just didn't know, or inefficiency to deal with the fact that we made a mistake and we have to back out of it and deal with in some way. And frankly, the result of many people is a frequent disenchantment with the legal system. We just throw up our hands. And that's not good because then law is not serving its purpose. Well, OK, so as, an, as a computer scientist, as an information scientist, I think that all is not lost. I think of this as an information problem. We have to get the right information to the right people at the right time. And so maybe we can do that if we had appropriate legal technology that would make that possible. So that's what I've been looking into for the past 10, 15 years. And uh, even before we started on it, of course, there was technology already in place, and it's in growing all the time. And that is textual representations of the law, making them available to all the lawyers, and now increasingly to citizens as well, by putting them into the computer and making them available via Google or other services like Westlaw, LexisNexis, and so forth. The bad news is it doesn't really provide that great a search. First, we sometimes get too many documents. Uh, worse, you sometimes get too few documents missing the one that really matters. And frequently you need to have some expert help explain them to you because they're too complicated, the legalese is too hard to, to, to wade through. So there is one alternative, and it's the alternative that's been dominating some of our research here in Stanford for, uh, for some time, and that's what's frequently called computational law. Um, it's a branch of legal informatics concerned with the mechanization of legal reasoning. Can we make computers not just vend the law in textual form, but actually be able to apply the law to a specific situation and, and give legal analysis of that situation to the individuals who are involved. I'm not talking about the courts here. We're talking about the individuals who are actually involved in, this, in the situation at the time that they're about to take st steps. So from a, from a philosophical point of view, this is very much aligned with the, what, what's often called the legal formalist school of jurisprudence. Pragmatically, what it means is that we may be able to build computers that could give advice to people as they're about to make decisions. So on the machine. So let me spend a little bit of time talking about this. TurboTax is a great example that anybody who's prepared tax returns in this country uh, online has possibly used TurboTax or some equivalent of that. You enter in some information. It has the law embedded in it. It tells you what your tax bill, ta ta tax bill is, which is great. And it's, it's, it's made the job of preparing tax returns wonderful for millions of people, tens of millions of people. Uh, and there are a lot of other opportunities of a similar sort, almost none of which have been done yet, but all of which could be done at the same level as TurboTax and bring the similar kinds of efficiencies in, uh, to, 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 uh, to the benefit of society. The fact is that companies have already discovered this. They've been using this techno similar technology, equivalent technology, internally for years now to codify their own rules and regulations about when you get reimbursed for travel expenses, uh, what pricing should be for various different people or various different products, and so forth. Those rules are there and can be used, and they're automatic, automated today. But we don't do that in the biggest, biggest industry on the planet, which is the government. 
So why not have the government doing this as well? I don't just mean internally, I mean in dealing with the citizens. So the idea is let's bring the technology to, to the citizenry and deal with some of the complexities that we're seeing with the law today. Okay, uh, that's, that's the concept of comp law and that's the idea of, of what, we're, uh, what we're working on here. And why is it now important? It's been an idea that's been around for decades and ever since the computers made their first appearance. But there's something special today which is the ubiquitous nature of computing. We live in this computing environment. We, have, we, we work on our computers, uh, the internet, we have cell phones, watches, and increasingly autonomous systems, cars and someday robots, uh, that we're interacting with all the time. What a tremendously good vehicle for not just solving our physical problems in the world and, and achieving our physical ends, but also a vehicle for communicating to us what we're supposed to do or what we're not supposed to do at various situations. Um, so let me, let me use a metaphor here. It's a little bit of an antiquated metaphor with the emergence of autonomous vehicles, but it, I think it, it will serve the purpose. It's not just cars I'm talking about, but I'll use cars as my, my illustration. Um, you know, we drive, we see instruments that tell us how much gas we've got, how fast we're going, oil pressure, and so forth. What we don't have any in, inside the car, by and large, is something that tells us what we're allowed to do. So let me just for a moment suggest that the speedometer could contain two needles, one needle of which is how fast you're going, another needle which is how fast you're allowed to be going here, and you might be above or below that at any moment in time. And it could provide all sorts of other indications as well right there in the car. Now there are some navigation systems that provide some of this instrument, this information today, uh, but it's not very well uh, kept up to date and it's not as comprehensive as it could be. But again, remember I'm speaking a metaphor here, the same thing can be applied in a variety of other areas. This has been done even longer in the aviation world where cockpits contain exactly this sort of information, these concentric circles here indicating where you're allowed to fly at what altitudes. And that's been around for a very long time. And is used, and that's placed right in front of the pilot, not just often a little handheld or in a navigation system that's not quite as central as it is in the case of an aviation setting. So uh, the cop in the cockpit, what's the cock, cop metaphor here? I'm sorry, I, I skipped over that. Cop in the back seat, title of the talk. Subtitle of the talk was the cop in the back seat. Because the idea is what if you had a policeman sitting in your back seat, a friendly policeman? who is constantly giving you advice as to what you're allowed to do. Uh-uh, no, no left turn there, sorry. Don't park here at this time of day. You gotta wait until four o'clock. Uh, don't go in that, that, that lane yet. So if you had a, a friendly cop sitting in your back seat, that's the metaphor here. Why can't you have a friendly cop walking around with you all the time? Not to arrest you, but to help you understand how to comply with the laws. So the cop in the back seat, the cock in the co co cockpit are, are two examples of that. But wait a minute, that's uh, not all. There's the cop on the internet. The guy who tells me when I'm shipping that wine to my aunt in Virginia that that's not legal. You can't send wine to Virginia or doing other sorts of things I might do on the internet. And it doesn't have to be only on the internet. So I'm walking around in Massachusetts and I see a nice flower, get out my cell phone, take a picture. It tells me, there's a little app there I go to, tells me exactly what, what, what breed of what kind of um, orchid it is. But also tells me, by the way, you're in Massachusetts right now. In Massachusetts, you can't pick that plant. If you walk over into Maine, it's okay, but you can't do it in Massachusetts. So why can't, as we provide an environment which provide a, a, a setting, a, a technology which provides us information about the world, also provide information about what our legal obligations are, what our legal rights are, are and the opportunities. So that's the, that's the idea that we're, we're working on. We'd like to see how far we can take this, this basic idea. Okay, uh, so for me, this is, this technology has a way of democratizing the law. It gets it out of the courtrooms. We, don't, we shouldn't be appearing in the courtroom in the first place if we're applying with the law. So let's try to make that information available to people as they're making their decisions at the point of decision so they get to make a choice as to whether or not they want to break the law or not and what they know the consequences are of breaking the law or not. So let's, let's make, give that information, make that information more available so that it isn't hidden in documents that are way too complicated to understand without having to hire the cop in the back seat or the lawyer in the back seat uh, in order to help you understand all these things, but to, to bring that information to you so you can understand what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. And not just cases like this where you're getting slapped on the wrist or told you can't do something, but it can also provide information to people who have 
uh, to tell them what their access, what their, not just their obligations are, what, what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do, but also maybe their opportunities. What, what, uh, what does the government offer to people? When can you get some support from the government, financial support, food stamps, and so forth? And, or an insurance company. Do, does the insurance company pay for my, uh, my sick mother or not, in, in home care or not? It's, you know, when I called them, they said no, but frankly, the answer is yes, they are required to. So let's have a way of making, of adjudicating that that's, that's based on the contract and not on perhaps the, the uh, inf misinformation that you may be given uh, by a single individual. Well, anyway, that's the idea. And so uh, legal empowerment through information technology is kind of the theme that runs uh, through our center codex. Um, and uh, just let me finish with just one more, one more comment um, about the law uh, being written down. There was a time when it wasn't 4,000 years ago. Hammurabi, back in 1950 BC, something like that, I can't remember the exact date, decided it would be a good idea to, to write the law down so it's not just the ruler's whim and opinion at each moment in time about what, he's allowed, what people are allowed to do and not, but that so people would know what the consequences of their actions were. So he wrote it down. It was literally cast in stone. People could come and see it and, and determine what that is. Since then, uh, the idea has been promoted. So you don't have to go to the stone to, to find out what the law is, but there's printing presses and now the internet that allows you to get access to the text of the law. But if the law is still too voluminous and too complicated to understand, it's not serving the purpose anymore. So why don't we go to a situation where we have a computer version of that law, which can, in a particular situation for a particular person, advise them about his rights and his obligations, and to and thereby better fulfill the, uh, uh, the, the, the intent of the law to help us function in society. OK, so that's the idea. It's kind of the, uh, uh, the Hammurabi of the future. And that's kind of what we're trying to do with, uh, with Codex. Is one of the projects within Codex is to try to take this idea of computational law and to, and to find out to what extent can we solve it with current technology, to what extent can we develop additional technology, and then to what extent do this, does the legal system need to adapt or um, to what extent can we use the, the details of the current legal system in order to promote this technology as much as possible? That's it. Thank you. All right. I have no slides because I'm going to try and maybe synthesize and respond to all three, which is frankly a little daunting right now. But um, I think that the word that started to pop into my head listening to everyone was context. Um, more and more, I think the broad stroke of AI in the law, uh, certainly as Nicholas talked about, has caused some problems. The notion that you can just apply it, but we also need a certain amount of universality. Um, but part of me was thinking, part of Michael's talk could be really dangerous, but at its core, it's a great idea. And I think what, what you were pointing out, Shrad, was in a specific context, you have to understand the tool that you're using. And I think that's what's getting lost. Um, and this is why I was talking about both words of caution and, and, and hope. So uh, a paper that I wrote uh, a couple years ago with my colleague, uh, Josh Kroll, um, what I noticed was every time I talked to people who did machine learning and they were talking about this notion of algorithmic transpar uh, <clears throat> excuse me, transparency, was this seemed to gibberish to them. And they would roughly ramble about everyone knows in a non-trivial system and a couple other words that as the unfrozen caveman lawyer, I didn't understand. But when enough of them said it, I, I started doing the reading, and it turns out they were quoting to me what, a thing called Rice's theorem. But then working with Josh, who's a, a computer scientist, right, computer science works within what is an edge case, which is, as far as I know, simply handing over the code won't reveal whether something nefarious was in there. But at the same time, computer science has been fantastic at things like bug detection, at knowing the limits and testing. And so I think this is where people have moved in a way that's fantastic. So as a, as a side note, two of the things that Josh and I offered that are part of the legal system is I, I think whistleblower statutes, in case someone's actually designing code in a way that is illegal, would be important. And that perhaps we should start a uh, public interest lawsuit system where outsiders who are testing code could in good faith uh, present the case to a state attorney general or the federal government, depending on who enacted it, and then they have a choice about whether they want to bring the case as an independent, with um, basically a private citizen, 
uh, attorney general statute. That will take a lot of time. That need, You need people who are actually capable. But those are ways to address some of the questions that have been raised. But more specifically, I think when we look closely then at the interaction, right? So um, I think one way to think about it is you have to have a mandated crash test, as you were saying, right? Like, so what does that look like? And that might be maybe better exposition on the actual limits of the tools as they're being deployed. Um, I don't think that's been done enough. And I think that's one of the real reasons there's caution out there. Because when, it's only when you dig in, right, on exactly, I think the, the, the notion of the original checklist, by the way, that was fantastic. Because what, what I joked with on the side was that checklist, I didn't know how it worked. It, that makes the judge into a bookie, right? I mean, okay, I got a little here, a little there, what's my over under? Good. Right away you go, okay, that, that's not great. <laughs> we can be better and more sophisticated, right? So the hope is the data reveals that was already a problem. Then the next step is, well, what's the tool? Let's understand that tool. Let's talk about how it's built and then get to that real policy question. The fear and the caution, I think, is the path dependency as a practical matter. So as these things get implemented, having been inside law firms, inside big companies, buying new software and changing it out, the law ends up with lots of path dependency. So imagine a system that does have poor data in it, or poor software, or both. How do you unpack that? How do you get rid of that path dependency, right? So the idea that the law might actually, if it were better understood from an information retrieval system, reveal flaws is great. I think what you know is the back end of that is, again, here's a hopeful moment. If we actually had self-driving cars, which I think we know now is far away, Driving while black would not be an issue, right? How does a cop pull over someone based on some prejudice when the car can be shown through the logs to not have broken the law? That's pretty cool. On the flip side, what if you want deviance in your society? What if we want a world, and I think there's a core part of American law that's about experiment, or in machine learning terms, what if someone wants to explore more than stay in the current exploitation? Right? How does the system still learn from human action? So the marijuana example was great because there's a moment there where there might be enough people who keep wanting to say, I think it's okay to smoke dope. And the notion of states being labs gets challenged, I think, the more we codify and set in stone software for legal services or the legal system in general. Um, so th those, are, those are questions that I don't think people have well, that's not fair. I've been hearing more and more people talking about that question of where's our freedom to actually say this law, although it is technically sound as a matter of process, I disagree. Right? I'll give you a weird example from a, a conference I was at where I was on the paper committee, and someone got up and was really excited because he said, listen, I can figure out norms. My robot went down halls and took a whole bunch of data in, and it realized that the custom was walk on the right. As we know from today's talks and everyone else, in a social context in around, oh, I don't know, 1940 or 50, you do that and guess what? People like me don't get to drink from certain water fountains. But hey, that is the custom. That is the norm. The system will not tell you whether it's right or wrong. But what it can do, and I think that's the hopeful part, is diagnose, right? So um, Susan Crawford's uh, paper that talked about potholes in Boston, if I remember correctly, the best part of that paper wasn't the gotcha of the first time through it seemed like all it detected was potholes in rich neighborhoods. It was that they were working, if I recall, with Boston University and used data techniques to visualize, to go, wait a minute, we live in Boston, we know that it's not just rich neighborhoods that have potholes, that's absurd, right? Or we, or we put test further, like, like you're doing. What does this tell us about rates of incarceration? And we might have to ask for, actually one of the coolest changes right now is, oh, it turns out that the reason people don't show up in certain cases is because they need a nudge, they need a ride. And that if we're gonna have a system that maybe does dis in ways that we need to talk about go more after certain minorities or treats men and women differently, by all means, let's ask why that is and see if we can say, listen, we think you actually do wanna be part of this system, but you clearly don't have what everyone else has, right? Reveal lack of social capital, reveal what's going on to certain groups. Data should be really good at that. And so I think the problem with legal services and the hope is how do you deploy these in a context, in a limited way? 
And one thing I would urge for anyone who's building these systems, especially academics, is be super clear about the limits of how these things work because judges are overwhelmed. They do want a quick fix. And so the idea of, wait, this is science, so I can just rely on that. The lack of skepticism, everyone knows, is a huge problem. But I think that's also been fostered a little by, you know, my former employer, Google, maybe, on occasion, right? But, but the sense of, we're the awesome data science people, how can you argue with this, even though in private, most people who do machine learning and computer science in general, they say, oh, well, yeah, we knew that it couldn't do that. that. That's a known problem here. Like, well, yeah, but when it got deployed as a business matter, as commercial software, that doesn't become as clear. So the ability to, to warn people and, and certainly to help judges and policymakers understand what you can and can't do with tools is vital. And I think that's where some of what you were talking about, Nicholas, on how do we actually make those trustworthy, right? How do we say here is our, if it's industry regulated or a third party, our sense of a crash test would be fantastic because that seems to be quite missing. Um, I don't have much more to say right now. I think maybe our discussion will be better, but, but in, there was so much to, to look at with everyone that, forgive me for being a little quick, but maybe hopefully the, the group discussion will be uh, a bit more engaged than us talking at you. Um, and with that, should we just take the, the mics? Yeah? yeah. Um, I guess to get started, um, since many of you guys highlighted, um, are, what paths of exploration ensure that AI or computation is truly uh, fair in the judicial system, as in not discriminating based on gender or race, and how can we minimize those negatives while maximizing the benefits of computation in the legal system? I would ping off of the point right now that the actual notion of what fairness is is already a problem. So that's big. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's getting into the mindset of people who use data well, which is continually interrogating it. What did it say, and answering why, which is a really tricky problem. So this is also why I meant what I meant about context. So there are so many specific techniques in machine learning that some are reducible into relatively few features, which even though I was at some time enjoying and laughing at the checklist, the beauty of the checklist is you know exactly how it works, and lawyers like that, right? We think that computer scientists build things as if it were a building, and they know exactly the blueprint, exactly how it works, and exactly what the failures are, even though computer scientists with sophisticated systems say, yeah, that's not entirely accurate. Um, so those moments are important, but it, I, would, I, I do go so far as to argue in the paper, deep learning techniques that are not able to be scrutinized may not be allowed to be used for certain areas where due process matters. Because that is one of those clashes where, sorry, I don't care how efficient it seems, as a society, we're probably not comfortable not really getting a grasp of what was going on in that system, at least for now. Um, but there are systems, um, depending on the number of features, where you could get a pretty sophisticated learning system and still make it something that other experts could, could interrogate. So those are questions of what are you doing, what's at stake, right? Going through the tax code, making sure you know your laws, that's a lovely example of, boy, Information technology should be helping us know right and wrong as far as it's written on the books. But going further about decisions that matter for your life, I think you have to be very careful about how you do it. I mean, you guys know more about the details on fairness. I think, do you have more there? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that all makes sense. I, I would add that I think the algorithm is a bit of a red herring yeah. here, again, that we wouldn't ask the same question of humans, and humans are the ultimate black box. Yeah. So it's you know, there's a sense that we understand how humans are making decisions. I think reality is we don't. We can, we can tell stories, but we don't really know how the judge is making a decision. And we wouldn't ask the question, how do we eliminate bias in the human decision maker? That's something that we recognize is not possible. It's not even clear what that means. Um, and so we... I, I do think it's important to hold algorithms to a high standard, but really I think of it all uh, as cost and benefits. And so if you were to design a system in a particular way, what are the uh, expected costs and benefits of deploying it? And in particular, is it better than the current status quo? And even better, can you? what else could we have feasibly done at this time? So to me, that's how I tend to think of these questions. I'm gonna disagree um, on a tiny point there. Judges are required to state, in theory, why they made decisions, at least yeah. in published decisions, right? And then appellate courts. Now, is it simplified? Could it hide biases? Of course. I, I think often the, the stated theories are not actually how they're making decisions. That maybe. So this is, I think this is a real problem. I mean, this is, I, again, I, I, 
I think we have to be careful not to take those on face value. The fact that if somebody were to ask me, if I'm grading a paper and I give somebody, you know, let's say it's an essay where, with some level of subjectivity here, so, and I give somebody a B, mm -hmm. and they ask me, why did you give me a B? I can give them a million reasons. Mm -hmm. Is that really why I gave them that grade? I think that's, it's, we're used to having that conversation and maybe there's some you know, like value to it, but I, I think we tend to give too much weight to those reasons. And so I would say the same thing. I mean, re really, when I, when I look at judicial decisions and I read them, often my reaction is that's not really why you made that decision. So it's- Right, but the beauty is that allows you to actually say that, right? That's where legal scholars, appellate courts say, y Your Honor, that, that can't be right. Or the rest of the people go, yes, I know what you said, but I'm calling BS right now, <laughs> right? That's yeah. the difference, is you have at least a chance to interrogate it and say, I don't think that lines up. I think what causes people pause is a sense that um, because it's, it's software, because it's data, and because it's difficult to, to probe those things and say, I don't think it's working the way it's supposed to, right? So I, I'm with you. Yeah. Of course people make up stuff and sort of, well, I, I really meant to be logical. I'm not gonna say openly that I really don't like people with, who are from Mars, but I don't. Uh, and, and you know, you're right. Mm -hmm. But in theory, maybe not always, we slowly but surely keep asking, yeah, how did that work? Or to your point, we start looking at the data over and over. Separate but equal, separate, it just doesn't look right. Right, no matter how much we can dress it up as, but the law says this is how it is. I just wanted to add, oh, did you want Please, to? no. Uh, I want to think again about, bring this notion up of institu thinking of the justice system as an institution and not just thinking of the algorithm because you asked what can we do. Mm -hmm. So in the case of the risk assessment algorithm Compass that is used to assess the risk of people, et cetera, right, being uh, recidivist, uh, which influences bail, bail decisions, right? or sentencing decisions. So what can we do? First of all, we should have research uh, in one way or the other that can be trustworthy to determine the extent to which, I mean, to your talk, right, those algorithms are actually making accurate decisions. I, I'm not sure if it's possible, I'm not a computer scientist, but I know for sure that we can measure the risk of recidivism of people that we release and see what they do when they're back out but how do you assess the risk of recidivism of the person you did not let out? Mm. You don't have the counterfactual. What would have that person done had they been let out? And so I'm not even sure if you can today determine actually how accurate those are. So again, I come back to this question institutionally. Do we have evidence to even induce the systems in our legal system that they actually function properly? And evidence that is sound scientific evidence, consensus evidence. I don't believe that's the case personally. Um, at least I don't think there is sufficient uh, <coughs> evidence. Certainly NIST, uh, which is an institution that I would trust, has not conducted studies on that. And so I would say as an institution, should these systems be let into the legal system mm -hmm. if the, such evidence is available, right? Mm -hmm. Think again about the institution. Judges today use those systems, but are they trained to understand those systems and not just those systems, but also how they might be themselves improperly influenced by those systems? Uh, some of you might know there is this phenomenon called anchoring, um, which means that once we've seen a number, it's very hard for us to detach ourselves from that number in making assessments. Um, that's a psychological phenomenon we're all subject to. I doubt that judges are trained in that to really understand how they must detach themselves from that. And so I'm saying that to say, again, that comes to competence. I talked about evidence of effectiveness. We don't have it in this case, which would mean we trip the switch to no. We don't have competent operators in the legal system of that. So institutionally, we fail the system because we haven't trained the people properly. We don't have a mechanism of accountability, right? Because again, if this, if this algorithm gets it wrong on a person, which again, we can't really know today, generally, certainly for the people we put in jail, you know, who do we hold accountable? The answer has been nobody. And we have no transparency because to, maybe some of you know that, but uh, a person who challenged that, the use of that algorithm and asked to look at the algorithms was actually denied that right by the court and it wasn't a crazy court, I don't think. They were trying to balance the, the intellectual property rights against another, which is also a very important societal value, against the rights of that individual. It was a complicated decision, but nonetheless there was no transparency or maybe not sufficient, one could say. So institutionally, and I'll finish with that, if we want to protect the institution, we need to think about how bad practices congeal and mm. good practices congeal and what makes the difference. And in my view, if we think of other uh, technological domains, we can see that, that we have adopted as a society broadly, we can see that these conditions are satisfied. We have evidence that 
planes can fly, that drugs can do well, doesn't mean that nobody ever dies. It just means we have systems at the level of society that tells us we have enough evidence that it does a lot of good, right? Pilots who fly planes, we know are competent. If anything goes wrong, we can hold people accountable. And we can have transparency of the right authorities across the board as to how systems for manufacture and so on. So that's the institution building I was trying to allude to earlier, which goes very much to process of how you induce technology into complex societal system, as opposed to just thinking of a specific algorithm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I'll pause on that. Yeah, sorry. Went, went on a bit. Sorry. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> um, okay, so um, I think the vast successes of machine learning have also led us to address these questions, which to my mind are most relevant in the context of machine learning or statistical analysis and are also appropriate in the judicial mm -hmm. world. So, way over here on the left end of the uh, from my perspective, <laughs> um, table. Let me point out that we're, I'm going to present the comp law perspective because there are a couple of issues here that are relevant to comp law. So our goal in this computational law is first of all never to get to courts. Yeah. We're not worried about judicial, we're worried about making sure that people know how to comply if they want to comply, possibly also considering enforcement. The cop in the back seat could also write tickets as well as to give advice. That is the case. And there's an interesting question there is whether it should be allowed to. So a good question that I would ask is, should it be allowed to report your speed to the DMV? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the month, you get the bill from your monthly bill from the DMV. How many times you spent this month? How much you got to pay? And your insurance company that you love. <laughs> you, Sorry. It's great having a, <laughs> exactly. Insurance companies already do this. Yeah. They will sell you, a, give you a cheaper rate on your policy if you report your driving characteristics to them. So when I ask people, you know, would you want us to report your speed to the DMV? The answer is almost universally, absolutely not. <laughs> no way do we want to do that. We just, we don't care about it. What if, about your insurance company if they give you a lower rate? Hmm. Now we get a real split about people who are willing to do that and people who are not willing to do that when there's an economic nice. incentive. Okay, but that's a question you can ask. All right, so, but are the idea is to, to help people to abide by the law or to at least understand what the consequences are. Implementing the law, operationalizing the law is the, is the goal of, of computational law. One thing you raised is there are exceptional situations. Context matters, all right? So I'm speeding because I'm taking my pregnant wife to the hospital. Do I have to pay the ticket at the end of the month or not? Are we living in a merciless society or is mm -hmm. it a you know, fair and just society? Which is that? Well, we have a legal system that can deal with appeals of that sort. And there can be ways of of appealing that, that decision and saying there were extenuating circumstances and maybe as a society we would like to have that done. But the facts of the matter are at least there precisely for, for the courts in that case to decide and either decide in favor of the motorist or against the motorist. What scares me more mm. is that there are other ramifications here, but they're, they're both ne ne negative ramifications but also potentially positive. So there's this branch of comp law called tech, tech it's, it's not actually tech computational law, but it's related to that, which is called technology-enabled law. Hmm. The question is, to what extent can technology enable more interesting laws to be written? Hmm. So uh, let me start just by talking, I'll go back to cars again. Um, so right now, if you drive uh, a truck on the road, you get this obey one speed limit. If you're driving a car, you get a different speed limit. If you're at night, you get to go one speed at day during another speed. So what about laws that would say, if you're driving a Volvo, you get to go 60 miles an hour. But if you're driving a Corvette, because it's less likely to get into an accident, you should be able to go 80. So what about differentiating on that basis? What about differentiating on the driver? Do you have 20-20 vision or not? Is your blood pressure high? Are you male or female? At what point should you make a decision about what's legal and what's not legal. Computational law doesn't say anything about that. Nothing, zero. What it says is you tell us what the law is, we'll try to figure out how to implement that. But what that does is to make explicit the problems for legislators to, to decide and not necessarily to leave it to the courts later on to decide in their own, in all cases, some cases that's a good thing. Um, but in some cases it makes clear that the legislature has to make these decisions. It can't just punt them down the road a ways. Mm -hmm. So there are those issues that are relevant, touch on the things you're talking about, but we're not actually in comp law concerned so much with that because we're not using machine learning techniques. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, cool. Thank you guys so much. And now some questions from the audience. Yeah, I have one for Michael. I'm really intrigued by, um, you know, by the code text. So I have two questions. <laughs> one is that, uh, as far as I understand, um, for text law, like terrible text I use the whole time, it's finite domain, right? There are finite number of rules, you can code them, you don't need to have big machine learning, right? It just code all the rules there. Now, for your code text, do you plan to take an approach domain by domain, or do you want to do AI, you know, kind of machine learning approach that deal with all the domains? Uh, so, good. so you're asking a personal question about what, we're, yeah. what our program is. The answer is we we, are, we we acknowledge the fact that there are some aspects of the law which are too too difficult to um, to to codify precisely, and so what we're primarily concerned with is that portion of the law which where the so-called bright line criteria mm -hmm. where it's very clear whether you're complying or not complying with law. Tax law is an example of that. Building codes are another example. Various other areas, the the, the laws are quite precise. Uh, and so those are the ones we're trying to concentrate on first. If we can even deal with 20%, 30%, 50%, that would help. But there's another aspect of this, too. If we can show progress on 20% or 30% or 40%, it may very well be that there may become a higher level of standard of writing of regulations, mm -hmm. rules and regulations, so that maybe it would be 60 or 70% rather than 20 or 30%. But no, there clearly are cases where it's very difficult to, uh, to so determine so whether... So I suppose the it would be to use the case law. Well, the ca case law is a different story. So case law, yeah, you could talk about it. The question is how you decide the cases. Now, many times cases are decided in, in the courts, and then sometimes people will write analyses of vast majorities of cases, where maybe it's done by, by using machine techniques, but are then kind of published and reviewed and so forth. And they become, in effectively, de facto laws, even though they are not literally written in the books. And those could then be incorporated into comp law systems. But the idea would be to wait for societal acceptance rather than to, to lead that. Just as a little gloss, what he's really also pointing out, right, is although we are a common law system, we've become more codified. Right? California has a very big civil code. And I think, correct me if I'm getting the CS wrong, what most of my friends who do computer science want is that if the law only gives us a spec, we can build to that. And there are parts of the law that, that, are, that you're saying that are spec-like, where yes, right. we, we've got a nice clean rule, and then it's like, yes, absolutely, giddy up. Get that machine, get the computer getting out there, and you will get to know how it works, and we can plug in X and find out what Y is, or, or something else. And um, Harry Certain has a nice paper on a sp specifically why the tax code is a great way to think about this, so if right. those who are interested in that space. Um, so there's a great swath there, but the more subtle things, right, the, the common law, the, the, the empathy the, the, that you talked about, the notion of mercy, <laughs> that's a whole other world. <laughs> okay, cool, uh, next question. Okay. Um, thank you so much, it's a great discussion. Um, can we, when we talk about fairness, can we ever achieve unbiased algorithms? Because algorithm by itself depends on a lot of contextual information, right? You talked about that, you mentioned that, you also talked about that. That every time new contextual information comes, it, it adjusts the algorithm, right? Like people were not allowed to drink from fountain earlier, mm. are allowed to drink from fountain now, right? All kinds of new things keep coming up. All the kinds of, can we ever capture all the contextual information to make a decision? Whether the person needs a ride in order to reach uh, the judge or not, and if the person has a um, uh, job, leave, can leave from the job. Can we capture all of that to make a decision whether that person has uh, uh, skipped the bail or not? Now, how do we achieve that fairness about contextual information? I'm going to defer for now. <laughs> um, I mean, we, we can't. I don't think it's feasible, but I, I mean, I, in, again, coming back to what I think many of us said before that's I don't think that's the right question. Yeah. I think it's can you do better than what we're currently doing? I mean, we would never ask that of a statute or of a human in saying how do we remove bias? How do we incorporate all the context? I mean, people are doing things in these messy environments, but I, I don't think that question would make sense in a purely human context. And I say that it also doesn't really make sense in the algorithmic context. And so it's it's just. I mean, algorithms are particularly good at synthesizing information, but then everything downstream from that is a policy consideration. We're back into the world of, of human uh, decision making and what we value. So I, I, I always phrase it that way. Not is there a fair algorithm, but is there a, does it provide information to help make more reasonable decisions? So fairness is a moving target, you're saying? I mean, fair, I, mean I hate using the word fairness. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it basically. The last one, the session. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's. I mean, I think it's a word that people that resonates with people. But I mean, whenever I hear algorithm, I just put law in as like this mental trick, and or statute or something like that. We wouldn't really say like prove to me this law is fair. Like we realize that that's not a well posed question, and so why are we asking the yeah, same? Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I don't think it. I think there's better and worse. And when we talk about discrimination, I think that you know that's a particular aspect of this that can get closer to what we want. But even in the law, I mean, things like disparate treatment versus disparate impact, we can say you're technically not, you know, your your, your decision doesn't depend critically on someone's race. That doesn't mean it's a good policy. Uh, there are all sorts of other other potential problems with that 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 I think don't get captured. Okay, cool. Uh, next question in the front. Uh, I have one comment and a question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Push back. Oh. Uh, push back slightly on one comment that uh, Devin said about the driving while black like mm. wouldn't happen if we had autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, I admire your optimism for technology, but I think the problem with driving while black is actually a lot more embedded than mm. just like cars and how they drive. Mm -hmm. For example, like they'll you know the, the issue is that cops are biased and will find some pretense to pull you over. So if you have a broken tail light, for example, it's used a lot, or like if they claim they smelled weed from the car and then they're gonna search you. So it's like even if the car was driving perfectly, right. you could still come up with like F a whole Fair bunch enough. Of I overstated <laughs> but but the core concept of I think you I'm gonna make up something about you know your lane movement or your speed, a lot of things that were pretexts. Okay, so it reduced uh, to, it to reduce your point the of, are there plenty of ways to, to, to as we said, there's plenty of ways <laughs> for someone with power to have well, I meant to do it this way, of course, right? But you know, even your broken taillight, who knows, if it's totally an Internet of Things car, you might have a thing that says, well, at this time signature, it looked good, and then the cop pulled me over. We now have a question. But I, I cede your point. Of course, sure, there's yeah. still ways in any system for I mean, someone the, the to The human to, element to is always going to be there, and you can always tweak Absolutely. The right. No okay. argument. You're right. You're right. absolutely right. And I uh, appreciate that. And then the question for um, Sharad was uh, about the... Um, is your main point basically, uh, are you kind of undercutting the point of the Angwin paper in ProPublica? And you're basically saying like, okay, it doesn't, like there may be bias if you look at it a certain way, but is, is, did, I, did I read your stance correctly? Is yeah, I mean, it's even stronger. I, I would claim that there isn't a reasonable way to see bias by that metric. Okay, now, is, it a, is it a fair counter argument that you could say that like the, the original data to create it was created by like biased policing? Is that like a fair counter argument? Uh, so I wouldn't call that a counter argument. I think it's a consideration. And so I want to be very careful about way I, the way I say this. I think looking at error rates is not a reasonable approach in this context to assess bias. That doesn't mean that the algorithm is fair or unbiased. Okay, so, I'm so making, you're saying so, there's a possibility that bias exists, but this particular way of slicing the data isn't a fair way to Exactly, it. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And just curious, do, do you actually think that the data is in fact biased? Like, in that, like, what is your actual opinion if you take out maybe a technicality for that particular paper? Yeah, I mean, I th again, I think I mean, the data are biased. Everything is, is biased. I mean, like I said, I think one of these, the big things that these algorithms are doing is they're predicting recidivism. And if when you look at public safety, this is a really, it's unclear what, how you even measure recidivism accurately. And so in some jurisdictions, if uh, the, these algorithms are trained to predict any arrest, and any arrest often will mean drug arrest, mm -hmm. and that is very much a skewed outcome, which I, I don't think that is, is reasonable. Um, uh, and then the higher level question, again, I do think all this is a red herring, that we shouldn't be focusing on the algorithm. Even if the algorithm is perfect, the fact that we're detaining people, locking them up, mm -hmm. because they're quote unquote high risk of failing to appear, and this, again, doesn't mean that they're putting on a fake mustache and like fleeing the country. <laughs> I mean, high risk of failing to appear might literally mean you couldn't get time off of work. Yeah. So I think that is where a lot of the injustice is. Uh, so I think the conversation, it's important to talk about the algorithmic aspect, but this is such a small part of where all the inequities in the justice system are that that's where I'd like to, to focus the attention. All right. Thanks for clarifying. And to echo that, I think that connects to what Nicholas was saying because I think a judiciary that understands those sorts of limits would be able to ask that question of, well, what I need here is a, a deviation, a, a, a something that social policy says, get me social services to help people actually show up, right? So in that sense, the, the system, when it's interrogated, reveals a very important point. And you can keep asking, well, why is that? Why is that? To the point to say, it's well beyond software and data. It's how we're behaving as a society. Um, there was, I think. Okay, awesome. Uh, next question. 
Do you see a point in time where you're, I mean, you're saying that you can't take away the uh, prejudice or whatever of a judge, that you would ever have AI just make the decision without, it sounds to me like I'm hearing um, technology assisting the, the person rather than taking over. Yeah. But like, for example, the bail reform that just got passed, I mean, the, it becomes like the, the, tech, the technology itself is making the decision without a way to um, contest it, which you've eliminated the humanity, you've eliminated the checks. Mm. So it doesn't seem like it's ready for prime time, but it's being rolled out. I mean, based on what I heard here, it doesn't seem like it should be making the final decisions, but it's happening. Yeah, and so it's, so this is a really good question. I'd say politically right now, um, and even I think by law, at least in some jurisdictions, you can't have uh, purely algorithmic arraignment decisions, uh, pretrial decisions. But if you take one step, so, for, so uh, in a lot of jurisdictions right now, what's happening is before a magistrate reviews your case, then you, then for certain types of um, uh, crimes, alleged crimes at the arrest point, there is an automatic bail schedule and, and literally like immediately after you're arrested, you can pay a certain amount and then be released. Now that is in a sense an algorithmic decisions, codified. Again, I hate this word algorithm, but really these are all checklists. It's just codifying these very simple rules. And so in that pre-arraignment period, we are using these types of codified rules uh, without human intervention to, to do that. We're not doing that at the arraignment point. I think we could. I think a lot of people would push back if there's literally no oversight at that point. I, I think a lot of people would push back. Is it good or bad? I don't know. I guess my, my gut reaction is we should have a little bit of discretion, but not a lot. There's this famous um, uh, 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 story that um, Meal, this, this judgment decision making, making researcher in the 50s tells that an algorithm is being used to predict whether or not someone is going to go to the movies. Uh, algorithm does like much better than the person's neighbor, like m almost all the time. All of a sudden the individual breaks their leg and then the neighbor is like definitely my neighbor is not going to go to the movies. Algorithm continues to predict persons going to the movies, <laughs> and so there are all these exceptional cases, these these so-called broken leg problems, where humans can see outside of the algorithm. But the counter is that humans view everything as, or tend to view everything as a broken leg. And so now, where is that discretion? And this is a big open problem that we feel that there should be some room for discretion to account for these broken legs. But if you end up treating everything as a broken leg, you've completely eliminated the value of an algorithmic aid in the first place. So I don't know where that line is. Right now, my guess is there's a little bit too much discretion in practice, but I do think there's, that there should be some discretion in that in that decision making process. Okay. Awesome. Another question? Okay. Thanks. So I'm wondering whether we can think a little bit about um, uh, implementation of generally sort of these new AI machine learning method methodologies um, in the judicial pro process because one of, one of the ga uh, key gatekeepers uh, usually are judges. Right, and um, the sense I got from the panel was that there's sort of this, right, AI is coming and sort of we need to, there, there are all these problems with all these different algorithms and decision making procedures and we need to rein that in in order to make sure that everything works fine. But uh, that assumes that, um, that um, lawyers and in particular judges are sort of eager to adopt m many of these um, uh, uh, methodologies and that's sort of not my intuition and not my experience. So I think what's generally true is um, the judges are very conservative, and um, um, Devin mentioned some of it, so they like to use things that they think they understand, right? So these simple checklists, they're fine, but once you use sort of deep learning stuff that's hard to interpret, um, I think there's a natural tendency just in the judiciary to not want that, so I, I work mostly in sort of NLP, right? Mm -hmm. And um, sort of we have quite, right, quite advanced methods to sort of find out what the meaning of certain words is, and that comes up in, in, in the judicial task all the time. They have to figure out statutory interpretation or contracts, what does that word mean? And um, they're now only adopting uh, corpus linguistics, so they are willing to do a, a quick search, keyword search through a huge corpus, and then look at word clouds, basically, right? And that's still very low tech, but they think they can understand what's going on there. And um, so one goal would be, okay, let's try, to make it, uh, let's try to make all of this interpretable and understandable for judges. But I would, I would think that there are many examples in which we already tried that and it failed. So judges still grapple, right, with, uh, uh, with um, 
basic um, the basic base theorem, right? Prosecutor's fallacy and sort of mm -hmm. how to use probabilities, how to use um, 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 ex uh, the unreliability of uh, of witnesses in a trial because uh, judges tend to think that they are. Uh, better than the average, sort of, in, in many of these interpretive tasks. So I'm wondering whether um, really thinking about sort of um, the advent of all these uh, technologies um, and uh, the need of reining them in, whether that is really uh, sort of a reasonable or a realistic view on what the probability of incorporation actually is. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I see it sort of uh, that you're up against a very conservative front here. Okay. I think there are actually three things, Leighton, in what you asked. One something I'm not as aware of, you, you might know a lot more about this. Um, who's purchasing the, the decision-making tools, um, right? State level, uh, sometimes municipal, and sometimes national level is a great question. And so that's sort of an interesting software procurement moment of how well was it vetted, who's moving quickly to use it, um, right? So the, 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 the piece that was uh, discussed was uh, county level, right, Broward? Mm -hmm. so, I don't actually know who was behind that. I think that's one of the reasons people are raising flags is, is it someone who just bought it without understanding it and then judges are told this is part of your toolkit? I don't really know at different levels of, in the US system and, and let alone in the EU um, how that decision is made. Separately, I think this gets to also a bit of what Nicholas was saying, which is the ability of a judge to actually be trained on how to use different tools is important. But the third piece is simpler maybe, right? Normally, for instance, and this is the IP question too. If you're using something that has the, let's call it the whiff of science behind it, or the reality, right? A breathalyzer tests certain things. As a defendant, you get to ask, is this thing calibrated correctly about my blood alcohol or otherwise? And the tension right now is it's different to be able to maybe do that in behind doors where the IP can be protected to whether it's possible to hand that over when you're dealing with sophisticated code and many, many people hours in developing it and lots of money? That's a huge question. So that's the third piece in terms of whether or not we want to be able to, to probe it, right? So that, that, those are the, the things that I think of in, in our, to try and break apart your question. But I'm, I'm curious, you know, does that fit where your article is? Well, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I was gonna say, very interesting sociological dynamics, right? So lawyers very often sometimes are, you know, they're trained to be conservative, mm. uh, but they also have a vested interest in inefficiency sometimes because AI it produces a cheaper legal process <laughs> than billable hours. And they are in a position where they can adjudicate that conflict of interest in effect. Uh, judges, you know, may not quite understand, and I, and I do a bit of judicial education, and so I, when asked judges how do they think of those algorithms, you'll get people who actually believe that because of what they've been told, they're actually, you know, perfectly unbiased, mm -hmm. right? And others who don't trust the technology as much, and others who say, well, look, what if I make a, de a decision that, that's different from the algorithm? Mm -hmm. Am I going to get in trouble because somehow the algorithm is, you know, making the right decision and I should not be following it? So. Um, I think we're effectively in a bit of a state of limbo and it comes back to this question, you know, why should we trust and at what point the, the introduction of the AI and what would accelerate it in a beneficial way? And that's where I think, that's why I really I got so involved with IEEE because I think what they're doing is very sound scientifically and it's all about creating the currency of trust, as I call it, which is standards and certifications that allow you, allow to tell you whether a claim is met or not. Today in my domain, and I'm somebody who really believes that the AI can advance, right? The function of the law and the values, that the values that animate the law. And I think in my domain at least, you can start to see that the institutional test I spoke about, that there is evidence that machine learning and discovery works, that some people are competent to use it, that you can have accountability and so on. That is starting to take shape at a place where you could start to believe that, yep, it's actually society can adopt this, right? Uh, but that doesn't exist elsewhere. And what, what happens with standards and accreditations and certifications is that you can test claims. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what that hap in effect, what happens is you see the, the burst of activity that happens with new technology, which is AI, slowly turn into sort of practices of, of those, some best practices emerge, and from those you create standards and certifications that become the currency of trust, that become part of procurement processes, and all of a sudden you have you know, a system that you can't be left out, where courts, lawyers, or others can't say, oh, I'm going to make my own due diligence, or I'm not going to, to buy something that's not certified in this way, 
or I'm, you know, I'm going to make up something completely different. That's what happened with data security, for example, right? We have data security standards today, and we can trust those, and it doesn't mean it's always perfect, but we're there in a much better situation than 15 years ago. Hmm. So that's, that's what I'll, I'll say to this, and that's why it's so important to think again of the law as an institution uh, and try to understand how sociologically best practices congeal and encourage that, and I think that's exactly the quality of the work that the IEEE is doing, and I would say even the Council of Europe, and that's why I highlighted those today in my comments. I actually have a question for, do you have any idea how well the, was it, it was the compass tool, right, was, was understood by the people who were trying to use it? In other words, did they say, was there documentation, do you have any clue as to, yep, these are the sorts of things you should know? Yeah, yeah compass is an unusual, case because it's they've released the factors that are used mm. but they haven't released the weights uh, and it's not even clear if it's a linear model okay. and so this was part of I think maybe Nicholas mentioned or someone else mentioned about the Loomis case and so yeah. that was part of the the issue there that it wasn't exactly it, 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 it can't be interrogated in exactly the yeah. same way as for example the PSA which I showed I mean that was literally what it does. Whether or not you like it is a different question, <laughs> but you at least know mechanically what it does. Right. So factors are informed to the judge, right? The judge knows the factors. Every, everybody knows. Everybody knows the everybody factors, knows. yeah. So judge at least knows that what has influenced this decision. And if certain factors which judge would include and not influence the decision, judge can include on that in the, whatever the judge is making. That's very hard to do. So, for example, let's say, so substance use is not on the compass, as far as I can remember, um, but something like past criminal history is. And so if a judge says, oh, here's a person who has scored medium risk by the tool, but I know they have a substance use um, a problem, mm -hmm. so I'm going to elevate their risk and say that they're a little bit riskier. Now, the problem is that that is already at least partially encoded into past criminal history. Mm -hmm. And so how That's do I know... But, but now, how do I know what the marginal value is for that extra feature that I'm going to add? So that's very, very hard to do, and it's related to this broken leg problem, that even if I know what the current algorithm is, I usually don't know what that, the marginal effect of new information is. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think that's all we have for time for questions. So thank you guys so much for thank coming you. and speaking and thank like being thank panelists. Um, so yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, CS Plus Social Good hosted uh, this breakout session for the entire conference. So we're very thankful to have this opportunity. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you guys for coming.